lecture 13 in the Western intellectual tradition. Call it George Grant, Owls and the Wild Hunt, colon, High Toryism and Conservatism, different paths taken, different destinations reached. Often we do Western intellectual tradition. The dilemma is we soar throughout time and history, classical understanding of political philosophy, philosophy, and start with even the Greek tragedians and the pre-Socratics, Plato, Aristotle, through the ro great Roman thinkers of Varro, Cicero, Seneca, Augustine's great works, Ambrose, Eastern political tradition, move through the Middle Ages, and then come into Machiavelli, Locke, Hobbes, Hooker, earlier, the High Romantics, and we, as we continue the journey ever onward, the tendency is to then end a course without landing in the historic Canadian context itself, as if Canadians have nothing substantively to contribute to philosophy, theology, political philosophy, and many other uh, important areas of culture and literature itself. Now, George Grant and Charles Taylor, who we've looked at earlier, have both been considered two of the most prominent public intellectuals of the 20th, 21st century, not only in Canada, but beyond. Grant, uh, born in 1918, died in 1988. Uh, University of Toronto Press is publishing <clears throat> in four volumes, and there's many more, the collected works of Grant. So he certainly stands on the summit in high ridges of intellectual thought in Canada of some of the most important thinking. And he not only thinks about Canada, but he draws together the best and the wisest of Western intellectual thought, as well as East. Grant was very drawn by to Gandhi, for example, and some key Eastern political thinkers. He, he founded the uh, Department of Religious Studies at McMaster in the early 60s, and it became probably in many ways the model of how one does religious studies in a very interdisciplinary way. And so it brought together the best of the Occident and the Orient, not only in religious thinking, but political thinking and culture and literature. And so Grant embodies in some ways the best of that Canadian tradition that threads together on the, the tapestry of thought, uh, a fine synthesis and integration of the history of thought and then what it means in the Canadian context. Uh, his home in Dundas, near Hamilton, he taught at McMaster the best years of his life. Before the book ends was at Dalhousie in the 1950s and 1980s, where he began and ended his life. But McMaster in Hamilton, where I did my studies, was where Grant taught really from the 19, early 1960s to the early 1980s. And so he, he, he drew together, he drew together some of the finest insights and then also grounded them in the larger philosophical issues we face today. The nature of liberalism as an ideology, as the train in many ways that we are on and the good of that, but also um, the, the, the challenges that liberalism brings to hot button issues such as identity and economics and culture and many area, other areas in politics and religion. Uh, his home was packed with owls, and owls, of course, are the metaphor of wisdom itself. And underlying a lot of Grant's thinking was the issues and the challenges faced by people in a driven, a busy, a frantic society, a culture that's very much the child of the Vita Activa, similar to the wild hunt, a medieval legend in which dead souls were driven day and night, they could not stop, faster and ever faster, faster. And if they dared to drop out of the constant movement and speed, their whole, what was left of them would just crumble into dust. And in many ways, the wild hunt is what Grant saw very clearly in terms of that drivenness of sort of secular Protestantism, a vita activa, that knows not know how to be still. And even though the language of liberty and equality and choice and agency and individuality is held high. The deeper issues is what drives a person. Um, 
the, the notion that somehow people can make choices and yet deep down often they're, the, they're totally the products of their unexamined and undealt with drivenness and busyness when they try to be still. In fact, they don't know what to do with silence and solitude and stillness. And so the internal, as it were, demon that drives them ever, ever on, like the wild hunt in the medieval legend, uh, Grant was attempting again and again to raise questions about that. And in terms of, sort of Thomas Mann's great short story, Mario and the Magician, the magician of liberalism has cast the spell over many in the West and also you know how to do is move faster and faster like the dead souls in the wild hunt medieval legend. And if they dare to stop, the fear is that in fact they will crumble to dust. There's nothing more to them than busy, busy, do, do, accomplish. And hence identity is defined by accomplishment and performance. And as Evelyn Underhill says, we conjugate three verbs quite a bit, to want, to have, and to do, but we don't know how to conjugate the verb to be itself. And so within Grant's thinking, at a deeper philosophical level, the contemplative uh, is almost a countercultural call to slow down and be still against the dominant addiction of the Vita Activa in our time. And in that sense, the owl, owl remains uh, the voice ever calling forth against the wild hunt of our culture that knows not how to be still, how to slow down, and the fear as if one does slow down, they in fact will crumble to dust because there's nothing there whatsoever within the soul. And so this deeper um, philosophic vision, which Grant attempted to rearticulate for Canadians and outside of Canada in terms of restoring what philosophy historically was meant to be in its classical, its uh, Christian, its medieval phase until it began to erode and break down with the coming to be of the Reformation. And then the secularizing of that, of the Protestant work ethic, his voice, clarion-like, called people to go deeper um, in terms of their soul and their spirit, their imagination, and ask, is there anything deeper than this hyper-drivenness? But when Grant translated his thinking, though, from the analysis of the contemplative and the active and deconstructing the way identity is hooked in to this hyper-drivenness in an attempt to reverse that tendency of which Hannah Rent speaks so eloquently about. Uh, the question is, what does this look like in the political realm itself? And Grant Ever, the owl, articulated from the deep well he drew from the past a high Tory vision of politics this weekend in Canada, Aaron O'Toole, at the present time the head of the Conservative Party, will be attempting to articulate what exactly conservatism stands for. And there is within political thought and political theory within Canada and the United States the tendency to think conservatism or republicanism is the same as high Toryism. And within that particular equation, the notion is, is that there should be a lighter state lighter taxes, more power to the individual to do as they think in terms of their understanding of identity, understanding of choice and agency. Now these understandings of conservatism, for those of us who have gone on this journey, is really what we would call first generation liberalism. It's the liberalism of Protestantism breaking from the Catholic tradition through the use of choice uh, liberty, agency, individuality, equality. These principles of liberalism were very much put in place, late medieval philosophy, and then the Protestant Reformation, its fragmentary nature, embodies it in a material, formal way. Out of that then comes the market economy, laissez-faire, as it were, hands-off. And the notion of laissez-faire is just not an economic theory, it's also an intellectual theory that no one has the right to tell anyone what the content of their choice and liberty should be like. And so this laissez-faire attempt, both at intellectual and economic levels, is very much central to what we call conservatism today, for conservatism attempts to conserve the 16th century 
17th century, early 18th century notions of liberalism that we find in Ab Adam Smith, David Hume. Often Smith is contrasted to Edmund Burke as if the one is the conservative and the one is the liberal, but in fact Burke and Smith were very, very close friends and they both saw the place very, very much for a lighter state, the market economy and the role of the entrepreneur. So when we hear the word conservatism today, it's very much um, a position in which the conservatives, either Republicans in the United States or conservatives in Canada, are really attempting to articulate and redefine uh, the understanding of the role of the individual uh, and as much as possible hands off intellectual and economic and the state, and hence the role of the use of freedom, freedom of worship, freedom of private schools, the freedom of the marketplace, and we can go on with all sorts of freedoms. And so, now George Grant comes along at a certain point, and he sees also clearly and so clairvoyantly the notion is that such a notion of conservatism, may will often hold the, the whole language of liberty or freedom, family, and faith as a sort of a trilogy that defines its inner essence without realizing that once you posit freedom, freedom itself in time will deconstruct family and will deconstruct faith itself. And so Grant saw also clearly when that becomes the spear point of how one makes decisions about certain things like faith and family and many other areas, in time all will be deconstructed. And, and just as Protestantism deconstructed Catholicism, and someone like, for example, a Luther who deconstructed Catholicism, someone like a Frederick Nietzsche comes out of a Lutheran tradition, he deconstructs Lutheranism and Christianity itself. And so the critical thinking that is a part of Protestant deconstructionism, uh, Grant saw also clearly where it actually goes in terms of how do you hold together a common good, a common wheel? What holds people together anymore when there is no center and each can use their individuality as they see fit to define the good, the true, the beautiful. What you have as Yeats saw, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. And so conservatism and Toryism are very, very different in their understandings of the role of liberty and the good, hierarchy and equality, individuality and community, and a whole range of areas, the state, and society. And when Grant, as a high Tory, attempted to articulate it again and again through philosophy in the mass age, lament for a nation, his massy lectures on Nietzsche, and then technology and empire, and technology and justice, he embodies a form of what we call high Toryism that is very different. It goes back to people like uh, Richard Hooker, Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity, Thomas More's uh, thinking on politics, Erasmus's thinking, Aquinas, Augustine, Plato, and to some degree Aristotle. There are important differences between Aristotle and, and Plato in the role of society and the polis. And uh, so <clears throat> when we think of Grant as a sage, on the one hand, he very concerned with the wild hunt of modernity, where it would lead and help people do not know how to deal with this drug which they're addicted to and the role of the contemplative in that process, but it means a total self-analysis and the nature of when a person comes off an addiction, the process of constantly being drawn back to that, as it were, the magician that Thomas Mann talks about so much in it was Mario who broke the spell of the magician, and Grant, in that sense, was like the Mario who attempted to break the spell of the magician of a liberal vita activa. Uh, and so when we think of high Toryism, it goes in a very different direction, and it ends in very different places uh, than the, what we call conservatism in Canada or republicanism in the United States. It starts from very, very different premises, the dilemma we face today, of course, is the train of liberalism, the tracks it runs along, both liberals, conservatives, NDP, they are all liberals, just of a different type. First, second generation um, liberalism, third, fourth generation liberalism, and then as we're into the postmodern thought and the 
conflict within postmodernism itself, yet another type of liberalism expressing the content of their liberty in different areas. And so, but Grant saw ideas do have consequences, and we're watching today how the very principles of liberalism continue to play themselves out in a variety of fragmentary ways. And then the larger question is what holds anything together in unity anymore? And so it is this higher Tory notion that looks at notions of the common good, the common wheel, uh, unity and the role of the good, the true, the beautiful, justice, peacemaking in this process uh, that someone like a Grant offers to the larger intellectual uh, culture and education of Canada. And in that sense, he and Charles Taylor are very significant in terms of how they engage these issues. Taylor being very much the apologist for sophisticated Enlightenment project, Grant being very, very much an apologist for a classical vision and its perennial relevance for culture, religion, education, politics, economics today.